will begin with, I don't think it's the one that's up there. We're gonna, we are going to do him 682, the God of the Prophets. There are no announcements this morning, so we will begin with prayer. Thank you, Holy Father, for bringing us all together for this study this morning. Please help us to know your will through this study and be able to apply it to our lives. Please guide us through our week this week. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Back at 11. I want to start off by thanking Dolores for giving me a do-over. <laughs> Did this a month ago, and I'll try to do better this time. 
I, I was, uh, at, when I was getting ready to, when I was preparing for this, I thought, you know, it's been more than 10 minutes ago, I don't remember what I said the first time. So, <laughs> in an effort not to re repeat myself too much, I decided I would queue up uh, YouTube and, and watch. It's, it's not that fun to watch yourself. Um, <laughs> So I'm, I'm watching, and my wife walks in the room, and she says, what are you doing? And I, so I told her what I was up to, and she says, oh, okay, and she leaves. And, and then a little while later, after I was finished watching, uh, she says, How'd, how'd you do? And, and I said, well, so-so. I said, I'm a lot. And she says, well, it, it's okay, you're not a pro. And <laughs> I said, it, wait, wait a minute. Now, I, for 30 years, I taught, I, I taught other, I trained people, I trained teachers, I traveled the state, people paid me to teach them stuff. Um, I was a professor in graduate in a graduate school for seven years. I, I'm a national national board certified teacher for crying out loud. What do you mean I'm not a pro? <laughs> and and she says, well, you know, when you were doing all that stuff, you actually knew what you were talking about. <laughs> so, And she's probably watching right now and, and be a little scary when I get home. Um, so that being said, I'll give it another shot. Uh, today, or th this week, I think that, that what our lesson was about is, is a couple of things. One, I think it, it addresses mentorship and the importance of that. And the other is death, or, or how we go. Um, before I get into 2 Kings 2, um, the, the part of the, the, the book that we're supposed to be looking at this week, I want to review a little bit um, last week, I'm a little jealous of John. He got to talk about actually what is my favorite miracle in the Bible. Um, and John did a great job. Um, but I just want to, I want to review it a little bit because I think it ties into what is going on this week. Um, so the miracle I'm talking about is when uh, Elijah challenges the, the prophets of Baal to, um, they, they build their altar and he builds his altar and the altars are, are made of stone and they put wood on them and then they put the oxen on them um, and there's 450 of them and there's just him and they get to go first and they're supposed to call down fire from their God to, to ignite the sacrifice and so they're dancing around for hours and hours and uh, nothing's happening. He's actually kind of teasing them. He's, you know, really kind of cajoling, you know, are you, you guys, can't, can't you do this? You know, is, has your guy left, left town? Is, you know, call him back. And so they're unsuccessful and of course then he, as you all know, the water gets dumped all over the sacrifice that he had put together and God burns it all, you know, the, the fire comes down and it all burns. And this is like a big multi-sensory experience. So you, all of those people there looking on are seeing fire come down from heaven. And when you think about it, it had to be really noisy too. So it wasn't just a visual thing, it had to be noisy. I mean probably was a big boom, I don't know. I'm sure that at least you heard the crackling of fire and sizzling of meat and uh, I don't know what burning rocks uh, 
uh, sounds like, but and it had to be a big deal. And, and then, of course, it smelled. You smell the fire, you smell the burning flesh. It, again, I don't know what rock smells like when it's burning, but um, there, would, there would be the, the sense of, of smell then. And then touch, you know, it had to be hot. I mean, anybody around there had to be feeling the heat. Um, and I think, you know, there's only, there's one fi of our five senses left, and that's taste. And what I kind of wonder is, is everybody standing around there, they're looking at this, and I'll bet their mouths were agape. And could be smoke goes in there or whatever, and it, it probably they had, they had, uh, taste as well. I mean, this is quite the experience. This had to be really something to be there. Um, and the reason I want to talk about this is there, there were two reactions I want to point out to this. Jezebel had a reaction, and Elijah had a reaction to this. Jezebel's reaction was to kind of dig in her heels. I mean, she wasn't contrite. She didn't, <clears throat> I mean, after you've seen that, after you've seen your guys fail and you see this other guy facilitate this thing, I mean, wouldn't you believe in the one true God as opposed to Baal? But no. Her reaction is to get mad and threaten to kill Elijah, kill, kill the messenger. And then Elijah's reaction, which I think is just as astounding, is he gets afraid and he runs away and wishes he could die. So, I think about that and think about, I'll, I'll talk a little later about this really does tie into what we're gonna, what we're talking about this week. Um, but just the whole, the crisis of faith of, of Elijah. And you know, we all have those at times. There are things that happen that distract us from the truth, distract us from looking to God. And apparently the threat of Jezebel was enough to distract this guy who just witnessed this amazing thing with all of his senses, in fact, he even, <clears throat> you could almost say he had a sixth sense because, you know, God talks to him. He had even the, the advantage of God between his ears saying stuff to him and telling him to do this stuff. But still, he gets distracted by this death threat and runs away. Uh, so, I'm going to tie this in later. Um, but now I want to talk about mentorship. So, so uh, in 1 Kings 19, this is where uh, Elisha is plowing with the, the 12 yoke of oxen. Um, and Elijah comes up and throws his mantle over him. And the mantle is, is a traditional piece of clothing for a prophet. Um, we believe that, there I said um again. We, we believe that it was a, a skin, a hairy skin of, a, of some kind of animal. Um, and I believe that Elisha knew that's what that was, so when this, this mantle is thrown over Elisha, then he knows that he's called. And then he, his, his reaction is he's going to go, um, and he goes and says goodbye to his family, and he burns his, his plow and sacrifices oxen, and, you know, he's done. He's, he's going to follow Elijah, his new mentor. And then a bunch of other stuff happens, but then we jump to 2 Kings uh, 2 for this week. And what happens in that chapter is 
Elijah is told by God to go to a bunch of different places. He's told to go first to Gilgal and then to Bethel, then to Jericho, and then to the Jordan. And each time that he's told to go, he tells Elisha, you know, you don't have to go with me. Don't follow me. And Elisha says, no, I'm following you. And this happens each time. And I looked up how far they went that day. And as the crow flies, just if, if they were able to do a straight line from one place to the next, it'd be about 25 miles in this day. But you know, it's probably farther because they, they didn't go straight, most likely. They probably followed roads, which as we know, roads don't just go straight to where you want them to go, usually. Um, so they went a long way. Elisha, uh, Elisha kept following. And when I look at this, when I look at the, the question that, you know, or the <coughs> Elijah telling Elisha not to follow him, what's that about? And to me, that seems to me like that's a test. It's like, I'm telling you, you don't have to go. So I'm giving you a choice. You can either follow or you can just go do your own thing. And Elisha consistently passes the test and continues to follow, even though it's a long way. Um, and along the way, the whole time, each time they're, they're at a, a place and then Elijah is told by God to go to the next place, there are prophets there who are kind of bugging Elisha and saying, you know, your master's going to be taken from you today. And he more or less just says, quit bugging me. Each time. Um, and I think this is just a little more of the test. It's a little more, it's a little more difficult. Um, so they move on to the, the Jordan River and Elijah rolls up his mantle, hits the water, and the water divides. And they walk across on dry, on dry ground. And then as they walk, you know, it's, uh, Elisha is realizing that El Elijah is realizing that Elisha is going to stick with him. He says, well, what, what would you want from me before I go? And Elisha says, I would like a double portion of your spirit. And when I first read that, I thought, wow, you, you, you want to be twice what Elijah was? But that's not really what the deal was. It, it, a little further research, you realize that um, that was just kind of a traditional way to ask, can I take your place? Um, I want to be like you. I want to be the prophet. And the reaction, Elijah's reaction is, boy, that's a hard ask. Uh, and I can't really grant that to you. But I'll tell you what, here's the last test. If you stick with me to the bitter end and you see me go, then you're going to get what you asked for. If you're not there, too bad, so sad for you. You, you won't get it. So, of course... Elisha hangs in there. He's hanging in there with his, his mentor, the person that he's followed, the person that he's learned much from, I am certain. Um, and then the chariots of fire and the horses of fire show up, and uh, Elijah's taken up in a whirlwind, and e Elijah Elisha, Elijah is taken up in a whirlwind, and Elisha, uh, at the loss of his mentor, is, is grieving, and he tears his clothes. And um, Then he recovers, and he, he's, he's got Elijah's mantle, and he goes back 
to cross the, the Jordan, and he himself is able to hit the Jordan with the cloak, and it divides, and he walks across on dry ground. And this would symbolize that, yep, he did get that spirit. He is the prophet now. Now, why did he follow Elijah to the bitter end? Well, he, he was devoted. Um, he had a true and, and good mentor. Who was Elijah? Did Elijah have a mentor? I would say yes, Elijah did. God was Elijah's mentor. And now, Elisha has asked for that same mentor. Elisha is being led by God. God speaks to Elisha now and does miracles through Elisha now. And when I think about that, so what does that mean to, for us? We all probably have had mentors in the past. We probably, some of us have been mentors. It's important when you choose a mentor to make sure that this is someone who really is worth following. You don't want to be led astray. And how do we know? How do we know, especially in, in the spiritual realm, that, that our mentor is the right mentor? And the way that we know is that whatever they do, whatever they stay, say, aligns with scripture. It's really the only way we know to measure whether our mentor is doing the right thing or not. Um, and it is, it's important then once you have a mentor to make sure that you are looking to that person and getting proper guidance from that person when you need it. And this is something that, that I th think I've kind of fallen down on, not always remembering to, to ask, not always remembering to seek guidance from my mentor. And I believe that all of us can choose God to be our mentor. I don't always remember to ask God what I should be doing in every situation. I think I think I'm too smart, which I'm not, but that must be what's going on. I think I'm smart enough to figure all this stuff out by myself, and that's not right. Um, I think about, um, I actually have been a mentor myself. I've had over a dozen interns in my time as a school psychologist. Um, and I have one guy who, who was an intern who about 17 years ago um, was my intern. And he, he's turned out to be, he's actually a really, really good psychologist. Uh, but he does way better than I do about thinking when, about recognizing when he needs help and then asking for it. He still, even though it's been 17 years, he calls me once in a while because he thinks I know more than he does, which is not really true, but he thinks I know more than he does. In fact, we're meeting tomorrow. Um, he does way better than me. He's not like I am where I forget to ask God what I should be doing. Um, and I'm thinking we all need to do that, and we all, of course, need to make sure that we are getting our guidance from a proper spot. And sometimes God, it, it's through our pastor or through another, uh, another person, another Christian, some other entity. And, and this makes me think of, of Jezebel. She did not choose the right mentor. And even when it was really put in her face, you got the wrong thing, she still dug in her heels and is following the wrong mentor. Uh, it makes me think of a time that was, uh, I want to say at least 35 years ago, 
I chose, I had, I had decided I wanted to learn about cults, really curious about the, the psychology of cults. And I met with some people who were part of a cult for two years, once a week for two years, and we debated. And it started with a couple of women from this cult, and we would go back and forth, and it was very interesting to me how they would dig in their heels and go back to, even given evidence, scriptural evidence, they would still dig in their heels and continue to believe what they were they wanted to believe. I'm sure they felt the same way about me. Um, but this, this particular cult even has its own translation of the Bible, and they gave me a copy of that. They, they have, the copy that they gave me was actually a, a parallel version, uh, uh, the ancient Greek parallel with English. And part of the problem with this particular cult is they do have their own translation, and so that's going to kind of mess you up if the translation is not accurate. And I took the, this to my pastor at the time and showed it to him, and we, we just picked, we looked at, because this is a verse that, that this particular cult really hangs on to, we looked at, verse, or at John 1.1. 1, 1. And he looks at their translation and he laughs. He said, they're not even following the rules. You know, of, of they just flat out translated it wrong in order to meet their need. And that it's kind of hard to, to really see the truth when you're, you're allowing yourself to be led by documents that are not accurate. Again, we need to go back to our own scripture whenever we are talking to someone about these things whenever we have a mentor uh, we need to compare to scripture to real scripture uh, these people even when I would talk with them about prophecies that their their organization had made that did not come true there's a way to tell whether a prophet is real or not did their prophecies come true and they would say well we didn't, you know, our organization didn't really mean that. Oh, or they might just kind of say, oops, yep, we, we got it wrong that time. We're going to get it right, right the next time. Uh, dig in their heels in, just like Jezebel. Dig in their heels in, and it was sad. They ended up, those two women that I met with, I met with them for about a year, and they gave up. Um, I couldn't convince them, and they couldn't convince me, and then they sent in elders. And that was interesting. Was the elders, they were really hard. Uh, very gracious, lovely men, but it was hard to talk with them. And they would talk about their own experiences of their organization. One of them, he was accused of something falsely and he got shunned by the organization and I'm thinking is that really a Christian organization we would not do that scripture would not tell us to do that so we need to pick our our mentor carefully and we need to make sure we're following the right one and I have some some ways to help do that if you would like but first I want to talk about um, the other thing that I think that this passage is about, and it's death. So Elijah didn't experience death like the rest of us are going to. I'm assuming we're going to. You may get taken up in a whirlwind. I don't know. Um, but what the deal was is, is Elisha, he's, he's scared by Jezebel, and then he goes... And he runs off into the desert, and he asks God if he can die, and God says, no. It's not your time yet. I'm not done with you. I got stuff that you need to do. 
So God gets to decide when we die. And you know, I've, I've talked with people, older people, who, who make comments like, I don't know why I'm still alive. I wish you would take me. Why am I still here? Well, he's not done with you yet. There's somebody you need to talk to yet. Something else is, needs to happen. So God gets to decide when we're going to die. So as we choose our own mentor, I choose God to be my mentor. And one of the tools that I have used to try to help along with that is actually a book that is a really good read. It's um, written, it's actually sort of written by a guy named uh, Brother Lawrence and it's practicing the presence of God. And Brother Lawrence was a Carmelite monk, I think in the 1600s, and he was well known in France. Well known, people would come, I mean, he was a very humble man, People would come and talk to him because he has this, this peacefulness about him. Um, and he would talk about how he was always, always, almost always in the presence of God. And when he wasn't in, how would he get back? Mostly has to do with just trying. But it's a good read if you're interested in trying to, to be in the presence of God all of the time. Um, and I'm also going through another uh, devotion, devotional now that's really uh, addresses a lot about hearing God and trying to discern whether is he the one who's talking to me or is it somebody else. Um, and that one, let me see the name of that one. Hearing God Through the Year. Um, So I, that's mostly what I wanted to say about mentorship and about death and dying today with, with our, our study. But I wanted to add one more thing. Our the Second Kings 2, our study doesn't go all the way through the end of the chapter. There's another paragraph. And I want to mention this because I got to tell you about my favorite miracle. Well, I think the miracle in that last paragraph was my dad's favorite miracle. My dad was a, a minister. Uh, and I think it, it would be the first miracle that uh, under Elijah's watch as a, as a prophet. And the reason I think it was my dad's favorite is because I heard about it over and over. My dad was follically impaired, even more than me. Uh, and my sisters and I would kind of tease him about that. He had, had a comb over for a while and he, we would tease him about not having hair. And he would then tell us about this story when a bunch of kids were teasing Elisha about being bald, making fun of him. And then a couple bears come out of the woods and maul the kids. Kind of a nasty. So that would be just his reaction when we were bugging him about being bald. And I guess I would like to leave you there. You can, you can interpret that however you want and apply it to your lives however you want. May the peace of the Lord be with you, and we are done. See you next week.